much like an iceberg, our lives have what's visible and what lies beneath. We often focus on the surface, our actions, routines, the things others see. Yet the vast majority of who we are, like the iceberg, remains hidden. Spirituality is just the tip. Our emotional health, the immense foundation beneath, supports and shapes it. Just as an iceberg can't withstand a storm if its base is weak, our spirituality cannot thrive if our emotional health is neglected. One might ask, can you be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature? The truth is, it's nearly impossible to be spiritually strong while you're emotionally unhealthy. To nurture a strong, resilient faith, we must dive deep confronting and healing our emotional wounds. Emotionally healthy spirituality is about bridging the gap between our spiritual practices and our emotional well-being. It's about achieving true holistic health. Join us in this transformative journey, exploring the depths beneath and building a spirituality that stands firm. And our series begins now. <laughs> uh, you just saw a picture of an iceberg. We'll put that back up again. That's the symbol for emotionally healthy spirituality. The reason for that is the iceberg represents how we're all made up of lots and lots of layers that exist beneath the surface of what most people normally see, okay? Only 10% of an iceberg is visible above the surface. Only 10%. 90% of an iceberg is below the surface, hidden under water, and the truth is the same is true with us, okay? Who we really are is hidden underneath the surface. And that top 10%, we carefully manage and manicure and even manipulate to make that top 10% look really, really good. But in doing so, what's down below the surface, we're concealing our motives, our fears, our jealousies, our sadness, our anger. That stuff only surfaces during times of stress or pressure. So most people don't get to see what's genuinely going on down below the surface. Let's switch metaphors here for a moment. Um, did you know it takes 10 to 15 years to become a stonemason? To, uh, to truly get it down and be able to construct out of genuine stone it is a really hard and it's a costly process. Uh, therefore, to become a certified master stonemason is uh, a journey most people don't want to take. But when a master stonemason builds something, here's the point, it can last hundreds, even thousands of years. It can, can survive severe storms that blow against it because uh, it, it's real, it's strong, it, it's enduring, but you need to know there's a cheaper alternative. Most people today don't use real stone. They use a process called cladding. It gives the look of stone, but it's actually just for show. It's, it's, it's almost like siding and it doesn't provide support. That's what emotionally healthy spirituality is all about, okay? Many of us in the church look like we're solid, we're, we're solid stone, but the truth is many of us are just showing the top 10%. We're just showing the tip of the iceberg. We uh, we say, well, I'm spiritually strong and reliable to the core. 
I can survive severe storms when life and pain and suffering comes, bring it on. When in reality, many of us are mostly cladding. Looks good on the outside. We look religious. We pretend to be mature spiritual followers of Jesus, but the people closest to us know better. Oftentimes the people who, who know us best, our family, our children, our co-workers, they experience the real us, okay? The judgmental, the unsafe, the angry, the fearful cladding that we've nailed to our exteriors. That's what we're going to be talking about for the next 10 Sundays. We want, uh, with the Lord's help and from his book, we want to tear down the cladding. We, we want to tear down that false exterior and begin the hard work of allowing Jesus to build the heavy load, uh, weight-bearing stone that's going to last, okay? We want to help you begin to build differently your life. We want to show you how to build your life on the rock, which is far harder and more difficult and time-consuming than building your house on the sand, on the cladding, if you will. We begin this morning with the problem of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. And, and I'm telling you, it's a problem, especially in the modern church today. It's an epidemic. Have you ever seen something that looked really good on the surface only to find out it's a complete disaster underneath? Anybody ever looked at maybe a car or a house and you go, wow, that's a great house or a great car, and then you dig in and you go, ah, not so good. Okay? There's this company called Theranos. Anybody heard of Theranos? Okay? It's it's a medical company, and they were heralded as the future of healthcare. Theranos was founded by a lady named Elizabeth Holmes. She claimed to be the next Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, only of healthcare. And that was what everyone was believing. Uh, Elizabeth and Theranos claimed that they had created this revolutionary blood testing kit, and they called it the Edison box. Okay, there it is. Um, she was the first female billionaire, according to Forbes magazine. Here was the idea behind the Edison box. One drop of blood in the Edison box could test for diabetes, HIV, drug levels, hormone vet levels, celiac levels, cancer markers, they claimed over 240 tests could be done with one drop of blood, okay? She was famous overnight. Fortune 500 CEOs clamored to be on her board of directors. Here's the problem, okay? The Edison box never worked. <laughs> it, it was a dream. It was a dream, but the truth is, no reality ever existed. On, on the surface, Theranos looked like the next Apple Corporation, and everybody was buying the stock. But underneath, Theranos was rotten to the core. Today, Holmes, Elizabeth Holmes, is serving year two of an 11 year sentence in federal prison for fraud misleading investors, providing false medical data to patients. Her company went bankrupt and thousands lost their jobs. How could something that looked so good on the outside fool so many smart people and be so unhealthy and toxic underneath? How, how could that happen? Sadly, it's not just companies who have this problem. It can even happen in churches. Um, put a slide up here. 
um, the rise and the fall of Mars Hill. That's a six-part podcast. If you want to get real sad about the state of church, um, watch the rise and fall of Mars Hill. It tells the sad, tragic story of Mars Hill Church, a megachurch in Seattle, Washington. They baptized thousands, and they grew to over 15,000 people in a place, Seattle, Washington, that was mostly agnostic. So they were just doing amazing things. On the outside, Mars Hill appeared to be thriving. But in 2014, boom, everything came crashing to the ground. No money scandal, no sex scandal. The pastor resigned. Mega celebrity Mark Driscoll, you probably heard of him. The board resigned, all the campuses closed, and Mars Hill Church dissolved. And we ask, what happened? What on earth happened? Three words, emotionally unhealthy spirituality. That's what happened. The pastor and the board were harsh and heavy-handed. They bullied believers. They steamrolled over the staff. Uh, People were fired and run over. They turned a blind eye to abuse. They protected their leader at all cost. On the surface, the church looked great. It was the standard of spirituality. But below the surface, they prioritized power. They objectified women. Another black eye for Jesus. (laughs) The world says, well... Another church, they're just another business. Toxic, poisonous underneath the surface. This morning, we're going to look at a case study of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. We're going to to actually look into Scripture and and see a a gentleman who, who is like exhibit A for emotionally unhealthy spirituality. His name is King Saul. And if you have your Bibles on your phones, would you locate with me 1 Samuel chapter 15. Saul looked really good on the surface, uh, but underneath, King Saul was a wreck. He really was. If you're able, would you stand with me? We're going to read out loud together. 1 Samuel 15, we're going to read out loud verses 7 through 9. 1 Samuel Chapter 15. This is God's word. Read with me. Then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. He captured Agog, the Amalekite king, but he completely destroyed everyone else. Saul and his men spared Agog's life and kept the best of the sheep and the goats, the cattle, the fat calves, and the lambs, everything, in fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for the opportunity to open up your word together. And uh, Lord, I'm praying that today you might speak loud and clear to our hearts and our minds. We're ready to hear from you. We invite your spirit, Lord, to come and take charge today in your church. And would you help us to look below the surface? Would you you help us, Lord, to look at our private, unseen world? Help us to see the inner Saul that lurks in every one of our lives. Might Jesus Christ be lifted high and exalted in your church this morning. And all the church family at Walloon Lake said with one listening voice, you can be seated. Saul was told clearly by God, destroy everything. The Amalekites, let's just talk, were sinful and evil, just like the Canaanites were, we looked at in our series we just completed in the book of Judges. 
But the Amalekites specifically, if you look at Deuteronomy 25, 17 and 19, you can look that up later, but they were known to be especially hateful and cruel to the nation of Israel. So this is payback time. This is, you, you've sowed, now you're going to reap. But Saul, who's been told, completely, utterly destroy Saul spared King Agag and the best of the livestock, okay? He kept back uh, everything that appealed to him and only destroyed, it says, what was worthless or of poor quality. Back to the text, verse 10, 1 Sam 15. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I'm sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he's not been loyal to me, and he's refused to obey my command. Samuel was deep, so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel, catch this, <laughs> to set up a monument to himself. Then he went to Gilgal. Okay, first thing we see about what's going on underneath Saul's life is ego, pride, and vanity. Uh, underneath the surface, Saul was super impressed with himself. Saul was super impressed and very proud of Saul. He, wow, I, I did a good thing. I'm going to set up a monument to myself. What a great king am I? Back to the text, verse 13. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I've carried out the Lord's command. Samuel answers, then what's all the bleeding of the sheep and the goats and the lowing of cattle I hear, Saul demanded. Note, Saul's trying to spin the situation and make himself look really good, okay? I've obeyed the Lord's command. The Lord bless you, Samuel, because the Lord sure is blessing me. I've done exactly what you've asked. And, and then Samuel says, um, then what's the sound I'm hearing? Why all the livestock noise uh, hitting my ears if you've obeyed the Lord's command. Verse 15. <laughs> it's true that the army, the army spared the best of the sheep, the goats, the cattle, Saul admitted. But, okay, we got a plan here, but they're going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We've destroyed everything else. <laughs> Saul's excuse. Notice, it's the army's fault. It's the soldiers, they're the ones who brought the animals. Uh, it's somebody else's fault. And besides, uh, yes, they did bring them, but we're going to do something good with them. We're going to sacrifice them to the Lord our God. Okay? So, so that's a good thing, right, Sam? Okay? Samuel wants nothing to do with Saul's weak excuses. Verse 16, here's, here's what Samuel says back to him. He says, then Samuel said to Saul, stop, listen to what the Lord told me last night. What did he tell you, Saul asked, and Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? Saul, the Lord has anointed you king of Israel and the Lord sent you on a mission, and he told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they're all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what's evil in the Lord's sight? Samuel goes right to the point. Why didn't you obey and listen to the Lord, Saul. The Lord has chosen you above everyone else to be his king of his chosen people. Why haven't you listened? 
Why have you saved the plunder? Why have you chosen to disobey? Back to the text, verse 20. But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I I carried out the mission he gave me. I just brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought in the best of the sheep, the goats, the cattle, the plunder, but we're going to sacrifice that to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Do you see what's going on here? Saul is deceiving himself. I did what the Lord asked of me. And again he says, it's really not my fault. Paul, it's the soldiers who brought back all the good stuff. That, that, that wasn't my idea. That's what they did. And now we get Samuel's famous challenge to Saul. If you know anything about this episode, here's the famous words. Verse 22. But Samuel replied, What's more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice. <laughs> listen, listen, Saul. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Submission is better than offering the fat of rams because rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you've rejected the command of the Lord, he's rejected you as king. The Hebrew word kwashab means to listen, to listen, okay? Listen. What's better than anything else is to actually listen to the voice of the Lord. Better than anything else we can do is actually to choose to listen and obey the clear voice of the Lord. Now, on the surface, Saul looks like he's serving God, okay? The top 10% of Saul looks pretty good. Well, he's sacrificing and he's obeying some of the commands of God. So, So it looks pretty good on the surface, but if you go underneath the surface, Saul's just skimming on his spirituality. He's not even aware of his shadow side. Saul's not aware of his motives and his half-hearted obedience. He still doesn't see. He's all about making excuses. So what's behind all this? What's going on underneath Saul's iceberg? What is it that's driving Saul? Finally, verse 24, we get uh, some insight. Then Saul admitted to Samuel, yes, you're right, I've sinned. I've disobeyed your instructions. I've disobeyed the Lord's command. Finally, he comes clean. I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. I was afraid of the soldiers and the army, and I did what they wanted me to do. Do you understand? Saul looked really good on the surface and now he's come clean. I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. What's driving Saul here as a leader? And the answer is, he's a world-class people pleaser. He really is. He's he's all about, I got to keep the men happy. I don't want to get them upset. I don't want to lead and actually do something that they don't want me to do. As Pastor Tim Lucas of Liquid Church said, Saul's ruling over all Israel with the emotional maturity of a middle school girl. He really is. He's just a little girl in his emotions. I'm I'm afraid. I, I don't want the army and the soldiers not to like me. You understand what's going on? Saul is shallow and totally unaware of what's going on below the surface. He's doing good for God, far outpaces his being with God. Did you catch that? He's doing a lot of stuff, but he's not spending much time with God. 
more outer activity above the surface stuff than his inner below the surface stuff can sustain. Okay? Now, just with me for a moment, how do you contrast King Saul with his successor who was, who was Saul's successor, the next king? King who? King David. Okay? So, David, we know, God's word says, was a man after God's own heart. But we also know David was an adulterer, sex with someone else's wife. He was also a murderer. He had killed uh, the woman he was having sex with, uh, his wife. He had him murdered, Uriah. Okay? So how can an adulterer and a murderer be a man after God's own heart? Okay? Well, when you read the Psalms, and I would encourage you, read through Psalms and see as, as you read what David wrote, David was always very aware of what was going on below the surface. Okay? David is honest about his emotions. When David isn't feeling good, he said, Lord, I'm depressed, I'm downcast, I'm angry with you, why is this happening? The point is, David is transparent. He's real with God. I'm broken. I'm repenting. Forgive me, God. I'm a wicked man. You see David rejoicing. And then you see David restored and forgiven. Okay? He's real. He's honest. He's authentic before the Lord and before other people. David doesn't fake it like Saul does. That's the difference. Saul was all about keep that top 10% looking really good and just ignore what's below the surface. David is transparent as he is just real. If you read Psalm 51, write, write that down if you're taking notes because that's your homework, okay? Uh, he writes Psalm 51, a song about committing adultery and murder and then coming clean and getting right with God. And think about it now. He writes Psalm 51. I, I read it and I thought, that, that, that's a song that we sing words to Psalm 51 in church. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away, from thy presence, O oh Lord. I'm telling you, it's powerful. It's raw. It's real. We read those words and we go, yeah, I can identify with that. David holds nothing back. He's hungry for God. I'm going to be still before you, God. And you don't ever see that honesty, that stillness in Saul. Okay? In fact, in fact, if you read on, in Samuel, you can do that, I would encourage you, uh, Saul actually winds up getting depressed and he goes mad with jealousy. Okay? He's so jealous of David, who's going to be his successor, in 1 Samuel 19 and 20, catch this, he starts chucking spears at David and trying to kill him. And then in 1 Samuel Chapter 21, David says, I'm not going to be pin the tail on me any longer. Uh, he runs for his life. And for a season, he's running from Saul, this emotionally unhealthy king. Question, why was he so emotionally unhealthy? <laughs> he's not, you don't ever see Saul operating in the power of the Spirit. You don't see uh, Saul operating in, in, in walking with the Lord. He's always operating out of this false self. The false self is the personality we project to God and others to impress, to survive, to avoid exposure, or to get our way. Okay? That, that's, that's what he's always doing. He's always showing his false self. 
give me your eyes, sprinkle in religion with the false self, the old flesh, you get fearful, defensive, self-promoting, manipulative, people-pleasing, avoid weakness, not self-aware. That's what you see in Saul again and again. And he comes to a very tragic end. Remember uh, the Pharisees who killed Jesus? You know what I'm talking about? They really thought they were doing God a favor by killing the only begotten Son of the Father. They, they really thought they were doing a great religious thing when they killed Jesus. It's so easy to go through life like Saul. That's the point for today. Bless you, brother. <laughs> I love you, Jesus loves you, Henry, and so do I. And the truth is, lurking deep within us, we all have a mini Saul ready to come out and hijack people and situations. There is a crisis in the modern church. Give me your eyes. This is serious. We're full of Christians with tip of the iceberg lives. We know scripture, we know a lot about Jesus, but we know very little about ourselves. We know scripture, we know Jesus, but I never take the time to look down what's at the bottom of our iceberg. This is, this is true. I think we have this slide here, Dan. Emotional health and spiritual maturity are linked. If you don't get anything else, please grab that today. Emotional health and spiritual maturity are linked. It's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. That's what we're saying today. You can't remain, I don't want to see what's going on down deep and be spiritually mature at the same time. It doesn't work that way. Emotional maturity spiritual maturity are linked, okay? The book that we're basing our study today by Peter Scazzaro, here's what he said. I was a Christian for 22 years, but instead of being a 22-year-old Christian, I was a one-year-old Christian 22 times. I just kept doing the same things over and over and over again. Jesus loves us so much Jesus loves us so much, he wants to help us in his power living in us to start crucifying the mini Saul that lives in all of us, okay? Saul was pretending, shallow, religious motions. He wants us to begin living like King David, fully alive after God's own heart. That's what we're going to challenge for the next nine Sundays after this, okay? And, and my challenge to you is do whatever you can. L let's, let's grow together. L let's learn together. Let's start crucifying that mini Saul I know lives here, but he lives in all of us. I want to go over 10 symptoms of emotionally unhealthy spirituality, okay? And if you haven't been taking notes, well, you're here. You might as well remember why you came. Let's, let's put these down. We're going to be looking at these for the next nine Sundays, okay? Here we go. First symptom of emotionally unhealthy spirituality is using God to run from God. Using God to run from God. In other words, doing Christian stuff so people will think well of me. I'm, I'm just very spiritual, Aren't I, Jose? And you fill your life, fill my life up with Christian activities so that I don't actually ever have to look below the surface what's actually driving me, what's actually motivating me. Second symptom of emotionally unhealthy spirituality, ignoring the emotions of anger, sadness, and fear. I got to own this one. This, this is one that I am still working on in me, okay? Because really, who wants to be around an angry, sad, or fearful pastor? 
right? No, no, I don't, I don't need that. I got that. So just bottle it up, Jeff. Ignore it, and maybe it'll go away. Not. <laughs> Third symptom of emotionally unhealthy spirituality, dying to the wrong things, okay? We're not called to die to the good parts of who we are, our, our identity, our, our new position in Christ. But at the same time, I am called, we are called to die to self-protectiveness, defensiveness, lack of vulnerability, and judging others. A fourth symptom of emotionally unhealthy spirituality, denying the past impact on the present. Denying what, what I've experienced growing up and how it affects my life today. John 3, 3, yes, I've been born again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, yes, the old has come, the new is gone, the, uh, the new is here, the old's gone. Philippians 3, 9 and 10, I, I am declared righteous. Give me your eyes. But sanctification demands that we deal with our family of origin. How I was raised, uh, how I've lived my life, I need to break free from unhealthy, destructive patterns that prevent me from loving others and loving God. And there's a lot more in our past than most of us would like to acknowledge. Fifth symptom of emotionally unhealthy spirituality, dividing my life up into the secular and the sacred compartments. Okay, So I, I have this Jesus Sunday Church Bible compartment and everything else is in a different compartment and you don't ever have to put those together. Uh, in, in other words, I, I can live a double life in, in the job, with my money, with my marriage, with my sexuality, and that doesn't really matter to how I actually love Jesus. <laughs> oh, yes, it does. Sixth symptom of emotionally healthy, mature, immature spirituality. Sixth, doing for God instead of being with God. I, I, I want to do stuff. I, I want to I evaluate my life for how productive I am in getting things done. When, when the Lord is saying, why aren't you spending time daily with me? Why aren't you quietly sitting at my feet? Why aren't you meditating on my book? Do you understand? I, I'd rather do instead of be. And you can't give away what you don't possess. Seventh, seventh, spiritualizing away conflict. How many of you like conflict? Can I see your hand? <laughs> okay. Uh, nobody likes conflict, yet everywhere we go, there's conflict. So many of us, give me your eyes, have learned to deal with conflict in unhealthy ways. We sweep it under the rug. We deny conflict. We bury and blame. We're afraid if I, if I actually speak truth, you might not like me, so I'd rather minimize conflict. I'm going to be a peacemaker. I might even tell you what you want to hear, even though I have no intention of actually doing it. Why? Because I don't want conflict. Um, eighth, uh, of symptom of emotionally unhealthy spirituality, covering over brokenness, weakness, and failure. Every human being on earth, regardless of your gifts, regardless of your strengths, you're weak, you're vulnerable, you're dependent on God and others. Okay? The, the truth is, we are all deeply fall, flawed. Henry, we're broken. There are no exceptions to this rule. None, okay? Number nine, living life without limits. This is another one. This is big for me because I was taught that good Christian pastors always say yes. Don't say no to opportunities to help others because that would be uh, selfish. 
to not say yes. Uh, so therefore, I'm always saying yes when the fact is I am not God and I can't be all things to all people. I can't serve everyone in need because I'm only one person. Here's what I've learned. Self-care is not selfish. It's simply good stewardship. I have one life, and I only have one life to live, and I need to protect the one life that I've been given and and do it as Jesus makes himself clear. Tenth and final symptom of being emotionally unhealthy, judging other people's spiritual journeys, okay? I sadly have done a whole lot of judging of others for this or that non-sin issue. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about disputable matters. And and we like to judge each other instead of just letting you be you on disputable matters and me be me. And then we move on and walk with Christ. I'd rather take the little speck out of your eye than worry about the log in my own. That's what we're talking about. And it's so easy to get into a pattern of judging others. I close with this true story. Give me your eyes. I'm going to change the name. You're going to understand why. Uh, Even though most of you never knew this person. I'm going to call him George. Okay? Uh, George knew the Bible. George fancied himself a Greek scholar and later a Hebrew expert. For years, for decades, every Sunday after the sermon, George would come and critique my sermons. Okay? I wanted, he wanted me to know that you miss this word, and this Greek word actually means this, and, and you miss that thought completely. And later, George presented me a manuscript of his own... Um, he took the Greek and, and he made it into his, his words, and I referred to it as the King George translation of the New Testament. He assured me this was far superior than any other translation on the market. Okay, So we have that side of George really smart about God's word. But George was also really mean and condescending to his wife. And George's children were afraid of him and ran away. He was controlling and judgmental. George had very few friends except for the ones he could control with his money. He had more knowledge of God's word than most any other Christian I've ever met. But emotionally, George was a spoiled child. He tried to get his way with money and manipulation. He was impatient. He was rude. And I won't lie, I quietly cheered when he announced to me that he was taking his money and leaving for another church. That's just the truth. And after he left, I heard from dozens of people who shook their heads about George and his ugly form of Christianity. And you wonder, how, how can that be? How can someone who knows so much about God's book, and, and the sad fact is he was an emotionally very unhealthy, immature Christian. That, that's the answer. You can know a lot, but if down below in your iceberg you haven't changed, you can be a spoiled baby. I'm convinced that emotionally healthy spirituality has the potential to transform our lives with Christ. I, I'm, conv- I'm so excited to, to go from being a tip of the iceberg church to becoming an emotionally healthy church family. really am. The challenge, again, I'm going to say it clearer one more time, too many of us, we know a lot about God's book, 
but we really don't know ourselves very well. We've never taken the time to go down deep. We consider ourselves spiritually mature, but the truth is, emotionally, we're pretty immature. That's the challenge before us. Emotional health and spiritual maturity are two sides of the same coin. I'll say that again. Emotional health and spiritual maturity are two sides of the same coin. It's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. You got that? You can't be spiritually mature when below the iceberg we're still spiritually immature. We can't love God and others, two greatest commands, when people around us find us judgmental, unsafe, and unenjoyable to be around. That, that, that can't be. That can't be. Let me say it one more time. Emotional health, spiritual maturity, two sides of the same coin. You ready to go on a journey? We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna dig down deep into the bottom of the iceberg. Lord, help us. <laughs> help me. Let's pray. Lord, uh, help us to look beneath the surface of our lives. The truth is, most of us would rather just remain unaware. That's the easy thing. We ask that you might begin showing us what symptoms our lives might be revealing about our emotional immaturity. So Lord, I, I am asking that even today, you might start working and surfacing things we need to process. Empower us to begin the hard work of digging down deep in the power of your spirit through the power of your inspired word to allow you to transform us. We want, we want to live your way. <laughs> we, we want to be all that you've called us to be. And I have a final question. Have you believed and received Jesus personally? Nothing's more important. This is the starting point for all of us. John 1.12, but to all who believed Jesus and accepted Jesus, Jesus gives the right to become children of God. Will you today believe Jesus is the Son of God who proved it by rising from the dead? Will you receive the gift of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus purchased for you and me on the cross? Will you become a child of God? John 1, 12 promises it. Here's what Romans 10 says. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that that you profess your faith and are saved. If you're here in person, <laughs> we'd love to get you going in your journey with Christ. Make your way to the prayer corner. We've got folks who will cheer and celebrate and get you going. If you're watching online, hit that prayer button. We'd love to have a private chat with you. Lord, thank you for allowing us to worship together as your church family. Lord, we give you permission. Work on that 90% of us down below the surface. Start that work today. We ask this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen.